We need heroes. We long for heroes. This longing shows up in entertainment, particularly in our thirst for superheroes. Did you realize that since the year 2000, there have been over 70 movies made about superheroes? They're everywhere, from X-Men to Wonder Woman to Batman to Deadpool. It seems that every couple of months there is a new superhero movie. In fact, it's estimated that there will be another 40 of these movies made by the year 2020. In 2018, the superhero genre has accounted for $2.5 billion of box office revenue. Maybe because of the state of the world, the unrest, the anger, the violence, the worry, and the uncertainty that comes with it, Hollywood has tapped into this innate thirst that we have for heroes. We hear this longing in our music. Performers such as the Foo Fighters, Drake, Imagine Dragons, and David Bowie all have songs that deal with this longing. And I'd be remiss on this point if I didn't mention the incredible cover of Holding Out for a Hero that our own Kate Bowen did a few years ago on the Footloose soundtrack. It's hauntingly beautiful. You ought to look it up when you go home. It's fantastic. It's on YouTube. You can really hear the longing in her voice in that version of the song. We need heroes. We long for heroes. But it goes beyond the fantastical to the practical. We may not buy into the superhero idea too much, but we have heroes. Those we look up to and take inspiration from. If you were a basketball enthusiast in the mid to late 1990s, you may have taken Michael Jordan as your hero. If you were a hockey enthusiast in the mid-80s through the late 90s, you may have viewed Wayne Gretzky as a hero. With more goals and assists than any other player, he's been called hockey's great one. We could go on, but the truth is, there is a part of us that looks for inspiration and motivation from those who have done what we long to do. As kids, didn't we want to be heroes? I remember very clearly the scene in the original Star Wars movie where Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia are stranded on that bridge that they can't get across because they can't operate the bridge anymore. He has to throw his grappling hook up into the pipes above and swing across. I played that out with a jump rope on a tree branch in my backyard more times than I can count. Part of it was I think I wanted a peck on the cheek from Princess Leia like he got. As we grow older, our heroes change, but we still seek them out. We may find our heroes are writers or business people or performers or trendsetters, but here's the rub. We find heroes for things that are important to us, things that we value. If you don't like basketball, you're not going to care much about Michael Jordan. If you don't care about hockey, then Wayne Gretzky won't matter much to you. We find heroes for the things that matter to us. So, why don't we revere the heroes of our faith more? All Saints Day, which is November 1st, in which we celebrate today, is an opportunity to do this. It is an invitation to survey the landscape of Christian history and to give thanks and look once again at the heroes of our faith and find in them inspiration, instruction, and strength. Because, friends, the best heroes are the ones who not only demonstrate greatness, but they call out the greatness in us. They not only forge a path, they call others to walk that path with them. And the saints of the church do just that. So what I'd like to do this morning is look at some of the lessons of the saints. As I go through this list, I'd like to highlight that none of these things are completely self-generated. We do have a part to play. But these are the things the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. These three characteristics of the saints are not just for spiritual supermen and women, but for the entire people of God. Our goal is to cooperate with our Lord, build space in our hearts and minds, and dare I say in our daily routines, for the Lord to grow these characteristics in our own lives. The first and one of the most demonstrated characteristics of the saints is devotion. They were fiercely devoted to the cause of Christ, to the message of the gospel. 
Devotion is defined as love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. In Acts 2.42, we read that the early Christians were devoted, had devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of the bread and the prayers. It wasn't just an occasional thing. It wasn't an on-again, off-again commitment. It was a constant in their lives. Let's consider St. Francis as our example here. Many, if not most people, only view Francis as one who loved animals. I mean, he's like the patron saint of bird feeders and bird baths. And it's such a shame because there's so much more to Francis' story than that. While praying in the ruins of a church outside of his home of Assisi, Italy, he sensed the Lord saying to him, Francis, go and repair my house, which as you can see is falling into ruins. And he took this literally and began begging for stones in the nearby town to help rebuild that small church of San Damiano. And over the course of two years, largely by himself, he did just that. Stone by stone, he repaired that church. He wasn't deterred by his father's anger or the disdain of the townsfolk. And eventually he began to understand that the call of God was larger than that little church at San Damiano and extended to the larger church. And through the order that now bears his name, the Franciscans, he was able to do immense good for the larger church and help others increase their own devotion to Christ. In our day like his, we need a resurgence of devotion. We need a review of our priorities, particularly those of our faith. If we wanted to play basketball like Jordan, we would need to practice like Jordan and be as devoted as he was. The same is true of our faith. In 1 Corinthians 1, 2, St. Paul addresses the church by saying, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. He reminds them and us of our calling. We need to renew our devotion to that call. If we're going to answer that call. What flows then from devotion is discipline. In fact, devotion is expressed in discipline. Let's go back to Jordan. He was devoted to his game. That devotion showed in his discipline of practice and working out, which often went on for seven hours a day. Countless shots in the basketball court. Countless time in the gym. If we are serious about our devotion to our faith, then it should show in our devotion, our discipline and dedication to it. Where are we with our prayers? Where are we with our study, with service, with worship? Do we do those things only when we feel like it, when we perceive we have time? Sadly, that is the case for many North American Christians. A growth in devotion leads to a growth in discipline. And a lack of devotion leads to a lack of discipline. We, mean, we pray not because we feel like it all the time, but because we are devoted to Christ. We serve not because it is always a convenient thing, but because we are devoted to Christ. We worship not simply when there is nothing else scheduled for the day, but because we are devoted to Christ. We study not because it is easy, but because we are devoted to Christ. St. Teresa of Avila was the first woman doctor of the church and founded convents across Spain. She entered the Carmelites at the age of 20 and soon found her prayer life dry and unfulfilling. What a disappointment that must have been. I finally joined the convent and I start praying and it's dry and unfulfilling. She felt herself distracted and impatient to be done with her prayers. But she kept on praying. She kept on studying. She did this for 20 years. And in her journals, she says that this feeling finally lifted at age 40. After some time studying Augustine, she found her prayer life more rewarding and easier to accomplish. Her devotion prompted her discipline, and she found the reward of her faith. Finally, the lives of the saints show us that devotion and discipline lead to daring. 
And what I mean by that is devotion and discipline empowered by the Holy Spirit are the raw material for us to live the lives we are called to live. And I believe the Christian life authentically lived is one of daring, of courage, of vision, and adventure. Consider what St. Paul says in Ephesians 3.20 when he says that God is able to do far more abundantly all, than all that we can ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. I believe we vastly underestimate what God wants to do in our lives and through us in our church and in our community. My thoughts on devotion, discipline, and daring were really brought to the surface when we took our youth group to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament last month. If you don't know what this is, this is a convent and a place of pilgrimage located in North Alabama. You've probably seen the sign as you've gone down I-65. It's dedicated to Jesus and draws visitors from around the country. It's dedicated not only to Jesus specifically, but as he comes to us in the Eucharist. But it all began with the devotion, discipline, and daring of one nun, Mother Angelica. And I want you to hear her story. In 1995, Mother Angelica was traveling in South America on business for EWTN, the Catholic television network. They were trying to plan and implement a Spanish television network like the one here in Latin America where so many Christians were losing their faith. So Mother traveled with two of the nuns to ask the support of the bishops. Colombia was among the countries that she visited on this trip. In Bogota, a priest, Father Juan Pablo Rodriguez, brought Mother and the nuns to the sanctuary of the divine infant Jesus to attend Mass. And after Mass, the priest took them to a small shrine where there was a statue of the child Jesus. And she stood there praying for a while. And suddenly she sensed the Lord speaking to her. He said, build me a temple and I will bless those who help you. She wasn't sure what it meant exactly. She wasn't sure what was to be done, but she persevered. After coming home from the trip, Mother Angelica shared this story with the nuns. And at once they began to look for land. And Paul's right there. That's confidence in God right there. They're not sure what to do next, but they started looking for land immediately. They didn't have the money to pay for it, but they started looking for land. And after several months of searching, they came to Hampstead, Alabama, just, just north of Birmingham. The property is an isolated piece of farmland, almost completely surrounded by a river. And from the very first moment she set foot on the land, she said she felt the presence of God very strongly. And from the very beginning of this adventure, the providence of God was clearly evident. The nuns had no money to build. They never tried to raise funds for the cause, but simply trusted in the divine providence of God. It was the, totally the project of the convent. The Lord manifested his loving providence by inspiring five families to financially assist with the initial building of the shrine. And each family requested their donations be anonymous. This holy place is a miracle of God's divine providence and the devotion, discipline, and daring of one nun. It was more than she could ask or imagine. What keeps us from being daring in our faith or dreaming big dreams of God's work through us and in us? What keeps us from taking a walk of faith with our God to do what he's called us to do and to be who he's called us to be? Simply put, I believe it is fear. We are afraid of what God may call us to do if we exercise great devotion. We are afraid of the cost of discipline. We are afraid to trust in order to be daring. Have you ever noticed how many times in the Bible God tells his people, do not be afraid? Over 80 times, over 80 times directly saying this to us, do not be afraid. And one of the principles of reading scriptures to understand that repetition indicates emphasis. They didn't have bold or italics or underlining. They used repetition to indicate emphasis. Do you think our Lord understands that we are often afraid in order to tell us 80 sometimes in the Bible not to be afraid? Absolutely. He knows our struggle with fear, but do not fear. Do not fear. He 
loves you. Do not fear. He loves those around you. Do not fear. He loves St. Patrick's. And each of those, he wants to do more than we can ask or imagine. And that is simply what he does with his saints. So now what? How do we do this? What are we to remember? The writer of the Hebrews reminds us, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Did you catch it? Where is this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us? The image is one of a stadium where the crowd surrounds those who are playing on the field and cheers them on and encourages them. That's the saints cheering us on. One day you and I will be in the stands cheering on those who come after us. As much as Michael Jordan and Wayne Gretzky may be your heroes, they're not coming to your basketball game or hockey game. But the saints... They surround you and I, cheer us on and encourage us and are examples for us. In the 1928 prayer book, the preface for Holy Communion, which you'll hear in a few minutes, reminds us of this. It says that God, who in the multitude of thy saints has compassed us about with so great a cloud of witnesses and that we, listen to this line, we rejoicing in their fellowship may run with patience the race that is set before us, and together with them may receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. Their fellowship. The saints show us what lives of devotion, discipline, and daring can look like. And I pray that you and I will follow their lead. We don't have to hold out for a hero. Thanks be to God, we are surrounded by them. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.